To the Digigods podcast, uh, a little longer intro than normal there for the uh, the ball and chain music. Uh, we have a little unusual show this week. We have a new co-host for a couple of weeks, Nadim George. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, Nadim has been a guest on the show before. You were on uh, what a few months ago, right? You yeah. uh, when I did a show with Tim, correct? You, you sat in on a show, yeah. So, so the, uh, with the the Ides of August and vacations and everything else have taken uh, a little a little toll on our usual uh, operational procedures. Uh, Mark, at the drop of a hat, I guess as everybody knows on the show, Mark has a long distance romance uh, that extends from Los Angeles to Paris, and uh, he, at the drop of a hat, decided that he was going to uh, head to Paris for a week and a half. So yesterday, Mark hopped a plane. And uh, he is off in Paris for the next week and a half. So uh, we are without Mark. And Tim it would normally have uh, sat in with us, but Tim has been on a grand family tour across the United States that's going to wind up uh, back in his native St. Louis uh, on the, uh, the day of the eclipse. So uh, Tim, will be, uh, Tim will be seeing 95% of the eclipse uh, in St. Louis. So Tim is not with us either. He's in, I think he might be in Milwaukee today. So Nadim, thank you for being here. Well, you know, your your listeners could actually turn off the lights and listen to this podcast <laughs> and assume they were under the eclipse. <laughs> and are you suggesting that uh, I take no vacation so I'm available in August? You're you're pretty much here. <laughs> you're you're around. You're you're easy to grab. So, uh, but thank you for being here. For those who don't know, Nadim is a filmmaker. So uh, please, by all means, chime in with any more professional observations on any of this stuff. Um, next week, you'll be here as well, and we have television next week. Ah. There's some interesting TV, and I know you you worked extensively in television yes, for many I, years. Yes, I have. So we will have fun then as well. So we've got Nadim with us for a couple of weeks. Um, I am going to... We also have an interview today. Uh, I, had, I did an interview this, uh, this week with um, uh, my very first film school instructor, who has a new feature film out. And uh, Terry Sanders, Oscar-winning uh, filmmaker who started in short films and then became a very successful documentary filmmaker. And uh, Terry is amazing and just recently did a, uh, a feature narrative film again. And uh, I talked to him about it, had a great conversation. Liza Liza, Skies Are Gray is the film. And uh, so we'll have that later in the show, my uh, interview with Terry Sanders. And meanwhile, Nadim, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of a breather. And I'm going to do what uh, Mark often mocks me for doing, is I'm going to roll through some anime. So, uh, and you know, I, uh, I, I watch as much of this as I, I possibly can to get a vibe for it. The thing with anime is that, by and large, these are long-running shows, long-running series. You, you know, you, you have to be part of the world from the very, very beginning. If you haven't been, it's kind of like jumping into a... You know, jumping into deep water. So uh, I'll try to give you a taste of some of these things, and if you think it's something that uh, that might suit your fancy for anime fans, by all means, weigh in. Please uh, throw off uh, any uh, any suggestions or uh, take offer any insights at godsdigigods.com that I might be missing. Um, and uh, first is Bakwan, the complete collection. Uh, Bakwan is another one of those. You know, Nadim, how how schooled are you in anime? Um. Not very. I'm familiar with uh, with Japanese anime and Japanese culture quite a bit, uh, but as far as specific animes, it's no, unbelievable. No. But I, it's crazy stuff. It's unbelievable how much of it takes place in high schools. 
Yeah, it really is. It's amazing to me that the, the, the just when you think you've seen it all, there's like another thing. I don't know if adults watch this, if kids watch this, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, Bakwan is a uh, is another one of these high school set things, you know, with the girls in the uniforms and the kids and their politics and all so that is stuff. Is there a Bakwan too? Uh, you no, know, this two? is this is twelve episodes. Bakwan. No, I, yeah, that, right. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. You got me. Uh, Bakwan, and there are two exclamation points at the end of Bakwan. That's the, the, the title, Bakwan, two exclamation points. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is uh, about an all-girls school that's also, and there's also a motorcycle club. And uh, everything is all very kind of motorcycle fetishistic, and uh, that's it, you know? It's, uh, it's coming of age in a, in a Japanese girls' school with motorcycles. I... Not the greatest animation, but it's not bad either. I just, I, I'm assuming that there's something cultural there that I'm completely missing. Uh, here's something that's really pretty tremendous. Uh, code, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, Geese, G-E-A-S-S, uh, Akito the Exiled. This is a Blu-ray and DVD combo set from Funimation. Uh, pretty impressive set. This is uh, really a, a, a really nice box set and an incredibly well animated show. Um, the, the world here, and this is a limited series as I understand it, this is a, you know, a, not an ongoing series, but this is kind of a one-off. Uh, so the world here is one of these, uh, one of these sort of mecha fantasy worlds, and, uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, uh, medieval, it's a little bit Lord of the Ringsy. And um, it's it's a it's a fairly complicated mythology, but it's an absolutely dazzling animation. The artwork is just really really impressive. Um, it borrows on the uh, on the very very angular features that that uh, a lot of anime has. But my goodness, it reminded me a little bit. It's got a little bit of Ninja Scroll in it, uh, but it's it's very very impressive. Really really good. So that is called a Code Geese G E A S S. Uh, Akito the Exiled from uh, Funimation, very very impressive. Most of these, uh, most of Japanese anime is incredible animation. Yeah, it's a subject matter that's often quite uh, inaccessible out, out there. Yeah, but you know, it's, they're very popular in Korea. They're very popular in China. They're very popular outside of Japan as yeah. well. Yeah, well, mm. you know, I did, uh, I did, uh, I was quoted actually years ago for a, what's basically a Chinese version of anime, uh, Choi Hak, the, uh, the, uh, Hong, the Vietnamese born, but Hong Kong uh, industry educated wing producer, writer, director, legendary, you know, produced all of John Woo's early stuff and directed things like Better Tomorrow 3 and, you know, The Blade, many other amazing films. Uh, and of course came here and did Van Damme films like everybody else, but uh, he produced an animated version of Chinese Ghost Story many years ago, which came out on DVD, and I had reviewed it at a festival somewhere, and uh, I was quoted on that box until it went out of print, and now, you know, no one cares anymore. But it was it was a Hong Kong film, but it was anime. You know, it was Chinese yeah. version of anime. It was really quite impressive. Uh, and then speaking of more medieval stuff, this is straight up, uh, this is DVD only, not Blu-ray, but this is straight up uh, medieval stuff, Samurai Warriors. And uh, this is also from Funimation. I don't know why it's not on Blu-ray. It kind of should be. Uh, it's based in a video game series uh, called Samurai Warriors, which I'm not familiar with. But um, it, it's it's really, really, really well, well done as, as well. Look, I'm a sucker for anything that's feudal Japan. It takes its liberties with the aesthetics of it and uh, kind of invents its own medieval look and style. And I guarantee the samurais here, they're, what they're wearing isn't like anything that any samurais ever wore in, in, the, in any of the actual uh, feudal periods of Japan. But it uh, doesn't matter. It's a lot of fun. It's well-designed. It's well-animated. Uh, it's got great music, by the way. Really, really terrific music. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting kind of um, uh, brothers separated between a conflict thing. You know, we see that a lot to, to brothers or two literal brothers or two brothers from the Shaolin Temple or two brothers that came up, you know, adopted into the same family and they wind, one winds up being a criminal and the other one winds up being a sheriff and... That whole thing. And got a similar deal here. You know, divided brothers, divided lo loyalties. Uh, but it's really nicely done. Anything samurai is super cool. Origin, Spirits of the Past, is uh, also a Funimation Blu-ray. This is um, much more delicate material. Uh, kind of, you know, Grave of the Fireflies uh, style animation. Uh, delicate lines. Beautifully animated, just the, just the same. 
And uh, this is a uh, this is kind of getting into a uh, I had to always make Lord of the Rings the analogy, but this is sort of Middle Earthian. It's not Lord of the Rings in terms of the the uh, the myth, but in kind of the uh, the idea of a Middle Earth, some some kind of mythical past that preceded our current uh, existence, and uh, it's uh, it. it it's kind of an ecological message going on here. It reminded me a little bit of uh, Princess Mononoke in that respect, but uh, very enjoyable, very nicely animated. And then we have also from Funimation, uh, Outlaw Star, Blu-ray and DVD combo pack. This is a this is a riot. If you like Guardians of the Galaxy, which we will be talking about today as well, uh, you will thoroughly like this. This is uh, this is straight up Guardians of the Galaxy anime style. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it means to be. It's released at exactly the right time. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's really a lot of fun. I didn't really understand most of what's going on here, any of the, you know, the galactic bounty hunter stuff or any of that, but you just kind of, you riff on the uh, on the visuals and you're, you're going to have a great time. Um, Record of Lodos War, OVA and Chronicles of the Heroic Knight. Uh, Lodos War has a long and treasured uh, heritage in anime. It's some of the best animated, animated uh, the best animation you will ever see in anime, and it is again very kind of medieval, very um, uh, not the not the Japanese medieval, but kind of more European medieval, kind of between culture medieval, and uh, a lot of magic, sorcery, and magic. It's uh, it's really fun. And of course, OVA. For those who don't know, whenever you see OVA on animation on an anime uh, set, it means it has episodes that were not aired on television. OVA is exclusive to the disc. So this is uh, the Record of Lodas War, Chronicles of the Heroic Knight, and the OVA episodes. Getting down here to the bottom, uh, not so funny is uh, Kumamiko. Girl meets bear, the complete series. Uh, this is one of those weirdly. Kind of strangely, uh, very culturally specific things that I just don't get. As opposed uh, to non-weird anime? Well, but it's like, you know, there, there are things in anime where you, where you figure, I, I need to have lived at the, ba- at the foot of Mount Fuji for the last 30 years to understand this. I just do. They're just, it, every culture has those things, and this is one of those. You know, there's a little girl who has lived in this village a very kind of backward village and uh, when the time comes that she wants to go to school the problem is she can't bring her pet bear she's got a pet bear a little girl in the village with a pet bear I mean there's the bear it's a bear she has a pet bear I don't yeah. get it I don't really understand does so, Caesar Milan deal with bears <laughs> maybe I don't know anyway uh, so it's uh, Girl and her bear. It's like Flipper or B- Gentle Ben. Gentle Ben. There you Gentle go. Gentle Ben, which I don't yeah, think anybody yeah. outside the United States appreciates either. Uh, Hayuka Part One. More schoolgirl stuff. Boys and girls in school. Don't get it. It's all high school, uh, and uh, they just want to. This time they want to uh, try to save the, the literature club. Uh, it, well animated, interesting story in some ways because it it winds up taking some bizarre twists and turns that you don't see coming if you can kind of hang with it. But um, otherwise, and it has an extra OVA episode as well. But otherwise, it's just strictly for people that like that genre. I got to tell you, strictly for that genre. And then uh, Mamoru Hosada, one of the great legends in anime, uh, has has put his name on Funimation's The Hosada Collection. So they are now branding all of his stuff, and one of those has been, um, this is one of the more recent ones from a couple of years ago, that made uh, the festival run and did very, very well. It's called The Boy and the Beast. This is like the bear thing, except uh, not as nice. This is, um, you know, a little bit more of a mythical world, and uh, there are animals and beasts that are kind of uh, Planet of the Apes-ish. And... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, it's kind of violent uh, and a little bit disturbing in some respects, but otherwise beautifully done. If you know Hosada's work, you know that it's, uh, it is meticulously animated. And then uh, right down here, we're going to get down and uh, go through some of these uh, fairly quickly so we can get to the real juicy stuff. Uh, we have a bunch from Sente and Section 23. Uh, one of them is uh, Food Wars, the first season, which is, m- which is more high school stuff 
but it's it's like Iron Chef and high school, and uh, it's. Uh, coming of age and and as a as it was a chef, it's again. I, I suspect that in a culture where you know, like France or or, or Japan, where eating and preparing food is a big deal, uh, it probably means a lot more. Uh, we got some Gundam stuff. Uh, the the Gundam stuff always, you know, you got you have to have been part of this world from the very very beginning, or you're going to miss it. Every part of Gundam just. Wraps back with every other part of Gundam. Uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, The Origin, Chronicle of Char and Sila, is actually really, really good. If you if you are caught up in all of your Gundam, uh, this this is really, really some of the best animated stuff you're going to see. It's really, from just from a design standpoint, very impressive. Uh, likewise is Mobile Suit Gundam uh, MS Igloo, which is just super cool. And this is kind of, this is like a photorealistic animation. Uh, completely, um, completely done. You know, CGI. It's not. It's not traditional anime animation. It's, but it's very, very impressive in that respect. It's really, really cool. And uh, then, lastly, much more traditional is Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt December Sky, which is uh, part of the Sunrise series uh, from Right Stuff. So um, all that is very, very cool. And then a uh, complete collection of Gate, also from Sente. This is 24 episodes of an absolutely crazy wild show that is just, uh, it's all hyperactive fantasy. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's like an alternate Japanese universe, kind of. Um, and it's uh, all about the, uh, the, the uh, Japan self-defense force and their efforts to sort of keep you know, all this otherworldly, um, these otherworldly threats at bay. And then lastly, uh, Nadima, you ever, you've heard of Sailor Moon, right? No, I haven't. And okay. I'm, are we going to get tested on all of this? No, later? no. Just know that for Japanese, for men who like anime, Sailor Moon is kind of like, they're like, it's like the Spice Girls of anime. Hmm. That's all you need to know. Sailor Moon, there they are. Very nice. Yeah, very nice, right? Mini skirts and the whole thing. Uh, Sailor Moon S, Blu-ray and DVD combo pack. This is from uh, Viz, the good people at Viz, another uh, primo anime distribution company. And, uh, you know, it, these girls are just absolutely adorable. I don't really care what the plot is. I just absolutely enjoy all of these little uh, kind of fantasy pixie girls. They're, they're uh, some of the most iconic figures in anime, and it's a lot of fun. So this is Sailor Moon S, Blu-ray and DVD combo pack. Do they have Godzilla anime? You know, there's know. animated Godzilla from the U.S. I don't. I am unfamiliar with any anime Godzilla. Isn't that interesting? You remember there was a Saturday morning Godzilla cartoon. Did you ever see that? No, I remember. I was yeah. growing up chasing wildebeest <laughs> in Africa. So <laughs> they didn't have the Godzilla cartoon. In no, we had one channel. Oh, okay. in Liberia. I was right. in Liberia, and Bonanza used to come on. That's what really? I remember. Really? Yeah. Oh. All right, okay. Okay, no Godzilla. Mm. Well, anyway, so uh, we've got, uh, before we get into the uh, interview with Terry, we've got new movies, a whole bunch of new movies. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to leave some of the, uh, the uh, higher profile stuff for a little bit later. Uh, I want to start off mentioning a movie called Wakefield, which is really interesting. This is a Brian Cranston movie, uh, Jennifer Garner and Brian Cranston. And uh, this is written and directed by Robin Swicord. Robin Swigert, of course, is the, uh, the a tr tremendous screenwriter of such movies as Little Women and a lot of other great stuff. He was also married to Nicholas Kazan, also a tremendous screenwriter and director in his own right. And they are the parents of Zoe Kazan. And Nicholas Kazan, of course, is Elia Kazan's son. So, you know, Robin Swigert is, is part of a, a kind of Hollywood royal family. And um, this is based on an E.L. Doctorow short story, and it's a really, really interesting movie that did no business at the box office, and that's why I want to encourage people to see this on Blu-ray or in some other form. It's a really cool Hitchcockian thriller, kind of in the uh, rear window vein, but it's, a, it's also a preposterous premise that requires very delicate handling in order to, to make it believable. And here's what it is. So, Brian Cranston is a guy who uh, there's been a, like a, a, a delay in the, uh, in the commuter train in the subway, and uh, he's coming back from his high-powered job late one night and uh, doesn't want to disturb his family. Jennifer Garner's his wife. Uh, doesn't want to disturb the kids. 
So uh, he just kind of uh, holes up in the little space above their garage until the morning comes. And then he kind of gets this twisted idea because he's watching his family from the space above the garage. And he thinks, I, I'm just going to see how they react when they, if they think that I haven't come home. So it's kind of sadistic. What if they think I'm gone? What if they think something's happened to me? What do they do? And this becomes, and, you, and he narrates this himself. You're inside his head. And um, this becomes a th almost a, a game to him. And he just lives there for months and watches as they panic, as the police come, as they assume that he's dead, as their lives literally change. He's up there living like a vagrant. He becomes literally a homeless person in his own life, watching the consequences of this game where he is trying to convince his family. He wants to see what happens. And you learn a lot about the background of the family and troubles in the marriage and this stuff. It's really an intriguing thing. And even as preposterous as it is, he sells it. Cranston's an amazing actor. He's really good. Um, I happen to uh, know Brian Cranston. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. He's a friend of a, of a dear friend of mine. Um, and uh, everything he does, he does really, really well. His movies just for some reason are not uh, that popular. I guess it's because once you've seen somebody do so much work on TV, Sometimes could be, you yeah. know, you know. Sometimes you just don't. You feel like, why should I pay to see this guy? I've been watching him for the last eight years or whatever. And especially when he's done it so well on yeah. television. Yeah. Well, I'm just happy that he's finally got a you know a, a film career going because he's so deserved it for so long. So, uh, really, a very very interesting movie. So that movie is called Wakefield with Brian Cranston and Jennifer Garner. Very well done. Bravo to Robin Swicord. Um, and it's on Blu-ray. Not uh, not much by way of extras, but uh, doesn't really need it. So uh, it's worth checking out. Uh, Nadine, did you see Guardians? I did. What'd you think? Um. You know, it's it was okay <laughs> compared to the not, compared to the first one. Ag again, uh, I think the first one to me was uh, better just because it was new. Yeah, see, that's what I was gonna say. Um, yeah. The second one, okay, so now I expect these guys to be even newer, and they well, sort of weren't. They tried to do that by making Groot a baby Groot. Right. Right, yeah. and which is cute. It's a it's a fun little you know it, what was used to be I am Groot is now I am Groot and it's a, yeah but uh, it wasn't enough. Are you did you grow up with the never the heard comics or no. anything of that sort? It was it was not a Marvel comic I was ever familiar with or interested yeah. in. Yeah, see, I didn't at all. So watching the movie was the first time I ever heard of it. I I have to believe that for most people that what drove them to this is not familiarity with it, but just trust in the Marvel brand. Yeah, yeah could I, be. I think. Although they sold it as if it, it was to go out to, to half the world, which yeah. should know what the Guardians of the Galaxy was. Yeah. Well, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, it's out uh, in 4K. Uh, James Gunn is a lot of fun. I mean, we've talked about some of his older films here before. He's a guy who really uh, applied his trade making low-budget movies for a very, very long time. And uh, he has a wonderful audio commentary here, uh, which you got to go to the Blu-ray to get the audio commentary. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fun stuff on the 4K, very very sharp. Um, but there's just not enough room for some of the extras, so they they got the uh, the Blu-ray where you can watch the movie with the commentary, and you know there's uh, deleted scenes and a gag reel and stuff like that. But uh, uh, you know, one of these days, I guess we'll be able to get proper extras on a, on a 4K disc. But in any case, uh, you got them both here, and uh, it's fun. It's but yeah, it's just not it's not as fresh. Do you okay? Are you getting a little tired of how long this is all being dragged out with the uh, the Infinity Gauntlet? Are you are you you're not even following that part? Of I'm, see, I'm <laughs> see, this is this is this is what I'm wondering too. You've so, just thrown me down the gauntlet. <laughs> okay, so, so, so here's the deal. In the Marvel world, there's a thing called the Infinity Gauntlet. And the Infinity Gauntlet is, uh, there are all of these gems. And uh, the, when you get each of the gems and you put them into the gauntlet, uh, then you have the power to control the universe, to, to jump between all of these alternate universes. It's like the ultimate power. And Thanos, 
who is the figure that I think they showed him just a little bit at the end of the first Avengers movie. He was in the, the tag at the end. Kind of a crusty-faced galactic demon guy, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, that's his whole thing, is he wants to get all of the gems and put them together in the Infinity Gauntlet so that he can control the universe. So that's why you have all of these movies, Thor and the Avengers and Doctor Strange. There's always like a little Jimmy Jewel thing somewhere that is part of the whole deal. And they are all going to be eventually be assembled. I'm assuming when we get to Infinity War, the next two-part Avengers thing, that that's where we finally have to deal with Thanos because he's been assembling over the last six or seven years all the gems for the Infinity Gauntlet. I just don't know how many people know that that's what we've been doing. And by the time we get there, I think a lot of people will be thinking, I don't remember half the movies that, that I need to remember to know where we're picking up this story. I, I completely agree because yeah. I had no clue what you yeah, were talking see, about right that's, now. That's where it's all been going. I just keep, <laughs> you know, eventually I start seeing things like in the Thor movie where uh, he's he's crossing the bridge to the to the to the place where you get transferred to another mm -hmm. another another galaxy yeah or another but he goes there on a horse <laughs> what's up with that I don't you got to ride a horse to go to somewhere you're going to get transported to a different dimension yeah can't you just be transported to a different dimension instead of having to ride a horse I, to I, get I, there i don't know i i am looking forward to the new thor film though just because, but you know what? Here's fun, here's something funny. Now I'm going to be looking for a gem. <laughs> the new, yeah, look for the gems. Always about the gems. The new Thor film, which I'm very looking forward to, because it really ties into the comics in a cool way, and Kate Blanchett and the whole thing. And it has Jeff Goldblum, which is great. Looks very Guardians of the Galaxy. Someone on our uh, on our Facebook page uh, saw the trailer and said they 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 poured a little Guardians of the Galaxy on my Thor. I thought that was a perfect way of putting it. Uh, and uh, you know he fights Hulk. In that gladiatorial thing. You've seen the trailer, right? I have not. Actually. Oh, you haven't? Oh, it's no. fantastic. But what's interesting is I've just been catching up on the third season of The Flash on, uh, on Netflix. And uh, there's an episode there, one of their filler episodes, where Flash gets transported to Earth 2 or 3 or whichever one it is and is lured there by Grodd, the psychic gorilla who is now living in Gorilla City. And I kid you not... Flash fighting this giant gorilla in a gladiatorial stadium looks exactly like Thor and, uh, and Hulk in, in the trailer. And I'm thinking somebody's really not, somebody's ripped somebody else off here. It's too, too, too convenient. Uh, a couple other quick uh, new ones here. Dan Stevens, hardest working man in Hollywood because he, he's trying to turn that Downton Abbey cred into 150 roles a year. This guy is not stopping. He's just accelerating. Uh, Dan Stevens is working like crazy and doing the weirdest parts. He's taking everything and anything, and uh, I don't know if it's wise, but he's certainly mixing it up, and he's turning into a really interesting actor. Not a very good movie. It's called Kill Switch. Uh, did, I don't believe this even made it to theaters, uh, by the way, but um, it's, a, you know, it's kind of a cyberpunky, futuristic, uh, wannabe Verhoeven movie. It, it's got a very kind of uh, Total Recall vibe to it. Um, you know, it's it's convoluted and uh, respectably well done, I guess. Uh, directed by Tim Smith, uh, who does not audio commentary, but uh, really the only reason to watch is Dan Stevens. Uh, Cop and a Half. I don't know if the, how this became a franchise, but uh, <laughs> if you ever saw the original Cop and a Half, they've invented a whole new Cop and a Half. Uh, it was originally a, a, a Michael Keaton thing, wasn't it? Cop I and a Half? don't even I don't know what that is. Yeah, <laughs> it was Michael Keaton, I'm sure. Anyway, Cop and a Half is a new one with Lou Diamond Phillips and some girl named Lulu Wilson. It's called Cop and a Half New Recruit. I, 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 Did I, that come I, out I, in the theaters? This? No. Oh. The original Cop and a Half is like 15 years old. That's what I'm, I'm, I, that's what's mystifying to me is like, okay, so... It could be a cop and three quarters by now. It's two and a half men. That's maybe <laughs> yeah. what inspired it. Anyway, Lou Diamond Phillips... Fine actor, but uh, deserves better than this. Maybe this is all he's being act. He's he's offered now, but uh, anyway. I haven't seen him in anything for ages. Um, I know, a very long time. Yeah, very long time. I mean, it's look, it's a guy and a kid. You know, it's like a girl and a dog, or a boy and a horse. It's a it's a genre, and we've you know, all about the all about a boy, right? I mean, there's a, there's a million of them. So anyway, uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Long Haul. You ever seen any of these? 
I have not, uh, but they are... Uh, They're terrible. <laughs> They're terrible. Uh, this is a Blu-ray DVD combo set for uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. They went and made another one. I'm not quite sure why. They're kind of all the same. Uh, this one's really more of the same. Bunch of extras on here, mostly uh, EPK type stuff, bloopers and uh, deleted uh, this and that and whatever. I, you know, I, I mean, if you saw the first one and this your thing, gotta knock yourselves out. All right, Nadim, let's talk about Alien for a moment. All right. I know you're a big fan uh, of the series. Yes. Not this movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Um, um, thoughts as to why we seem to have run aground with the Alien franchise? Well, I, uh, for me, for me um, it ran aground uh, maybe in the previous one. Um, the exciting thing Prometheus. about... Prometheus. Yes. Yeah. The exciting thing about Alien was discovering the creature. Right. And that's what made the very first Alien so wonderful. Yeah. Is... You know, you would get some slime here and there. You would get this, but you really didn't. It was anticipation of the creature that made the movie good. Where in this latest one, it's right there. Now, let me ask you this, too, because we I should point out to Prometheus in, to go along with this. Alien Covenant comes out this week on uh, on 4K um, and and Blu-ray, obviously. But 4K, they're really pumping the 4K and they really want this to kind of ride. And to do that, they've also come out with Prometheus. They've re-released Prometheus this week on 4K. Uh, so the whole new, this new relaunch, re, re, it's, it's not really a reboot. It's a, it's a new, it's a new thread. It's a new way of approaching the alien series, uh, with Ridley Scott coming back. Um, and I, I, here are my, here are my issues. Tell me if you, if you agree. I don't think even the original aliens. I agree. Okay. Okay. No. <laughs> the original, the original alien succeeded because it built anticipation two different ways. It built it first in the marketing and then in the movie itself. So they're already arousing your suspicion with that trailer. And if you've never seen the trailer, do you remember the original trailer? I do. It was incredible. It's one of the great trailers of all time because mm -hmm. it ends and, and you see nothing and all you know is something horrible is happening and then they give you that, it's all quiet, that in space no one can hear you scream. And then of course the, 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 the ads were just the egg and the right. tagline. It's cryptic and it was genius. And then there's the word alien. You filled in, it, and then the movie really milked it for a long time. Didn't scratch the itch. I think all of that anticipation is gone. That's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. it's just, it's, um, yeah. And I think, uh, obviously, being marketed that way, um, if there wasn't a payoff in the original one, you probably would not have enjoyed the movie. But Very true. Uh, so it was there, it just kept you dangling with a little bit of slime here and a yeah. little bit of this there. Yeah. And uh, eventually you got to see this. Uh. Well, I, I, and d does it feel like Ridley Scott has, I mean, he's, you know, he's almost 80 now. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's still he's up there. He's a young, I mean, he's a young, I mean, you know, he didn't start directing films till he was in his 40s. But uh, does it feel like he's, does it feel like he's, he's lost the, lost his touch, lost his interest? Why, you know, or is he, is he just resting on his laurels? Is he too old? I, I, I can't quite figure out what it is. I think it could be all of the above. Yeah. And also the pressure of uh, the financial pressure. Right. Uh, not that he has any financial pressure, but I'm just saying that the idea that uh, these movies are going to make a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, no, you can't, uh, you can't drop it. You have to make another one. True. Really? Do you think CGI makes some things too easy? Mm, I think it makes a decision easier. Yeah. In other words, you know, you had to think twice 20 years ago if you wanted to put this film out yeah. because it would have been so costly and maybe the technology wasn't quite there. But now that it's there, um, with some of the technology available on your laptop... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, it's a lot easier to say, yeah, let's do another one. Why not? Crazy. Amazing, you can do stuff on your laptop. It used to take entire sound stages and, and armies of studio technicians to do in the 1940s. It's well, I mean, just things like saying you're you have enough computing power in your uh, in your uh, in your smartphone, yeah, than what they sent to the moon. To the moon. I know, crazy. Well, anyway, uh, Alien Covenant, I don't think it's a bad movie. I just, I you know, it just feels like you find it too preachy. 
for yeah. what it's supposed to be an alien movie. Yeah, there, there's, there's. The, I feel, I find most movies too preachy these days. But I also think it, um, the, I think the metaphor is different now. The original Alien was, it was an interesting moment because it was the end of the 1970s. And, you know, this gets back to when I, when I taught film history. I always talked about the context of a film. You know, you can't just always evaluate a film as a film. You look at a lot of these movies in their historical context. And 1979 was really interesting because it was the moment it came right, it sort of, everything began, exploitation movies began going mainstream with The, with, with the Exorcist. The Exorcist was the first major studio movie that took something that previously would have been a cheesy drive-in movie and made it mainstream. Jaws blew it up, and then Star Wars and Close Encounters mainstreamed it like nobody's business. So by the time you get to Alien, well, that's basically still an exploitation film, but it's, it's just it's harder, it's rougher, it's, in the, it's, it's beyond Star Wars. It's gritty, and um, uh, it, it wound up almost being a metaphor for all of the fears that had bundled up throughout the 1970s with you know, Watergate and Vietnam and the recession, and this is literally the tail end of the Carter years. And there are gas lines, and uh, yeah, there's Cold a lot War. of... Cold War. Yeah, the Cold War. There's a lot of anxiety in 1979. I mean, I remember that really well. There's a lot of anxiety, and a lot of economic anxiety, and especially. And I, 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 you know, I think our anxiety today is different. I don't think you can analogize it to an alien film. So they're trying to sort of... The preachiness of it, I, I think, is part of trying to give it, trying to project a new meaning onto it that it's not suited for, mm. if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, uh, the Exception. Oh, gosh, The Exception. I've forgotten about this. Did you see this? Uh, no. Okay. So, I, uh, you know, I slipped, this, I slipped this in today, like a couple of weeks ago, and I'd forgotten that I'd even seen the movie. So the, here's the deal with the exception. Christopher Plummer's great in this. This is a story I'd never even known. Uh, with Nazis being all in the news again lately, perfect film to talk about. So Kaiser Wilhelm of World War I fame, people often wonder, I think everybody kind of forgets, well, you know, World War I ended and he was deposed and the Weimar Republic came in. What happened to him? Well, he basically went into exile. And he was still alive when Hitler rose to power on the eve of World War II. Uh, and there was there were some interesting political machinations going on because a lot of the people in in the Nazi hierarchy wanted to put Kaiser Wilhelm back on the throne. Others did not. There was an interesting little and and truly the people around him thought that the first thing that Hitler would do is bring the Kaiser back, right? Because he's the rightful monarch of and um that's not at all what happened wanted to use him and there's a whole fascinating uh kind of uh, espionage subplot here with uh, lily james who's very good in this and um is this uh, a docudrama it's or not is it's, it's, a, a, it's a thriller it's a straight up world war ii era thriller but is it based on truth it's, or it just is simply? based a little bit on truth okay. i don't i don't think there the lily taylor character who is this you know who's a jewish maid that is working with the resistance to try and potentially assassinate Kaiser Wilhelm, and there's a whole there's a whole interesting thing there. I don't think that's necessarily uh, factual, but um, it's very very interesting on on balance the way that they put all this together. So even though I I, I think a lot of it really stretches credibility, I uh, you know I thought it was on balance pretty well done, and Christopher Plummer is perfect casting as Kaiser Wilhelm, perfect, absolutely perfect. Um, Let's talk about why they keep making King Arthur movies for a moment. Could we, could we shoot that in the foot? Excalibur, your yes. favorite? Your favorite, like it is mine? Uh, yes, of, of all of them. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So why do people keep making them? I don't know. I happened to put this on late night, hoping that uh, I could... Uh, Stay awake. <laughs> I kept falling asleep and the battle sequences kept uh, getting me out of my stupor. Well, I mean, Guy Ritchie is not... This is King Arthur Legend of the Sword, which is out on Blu-ray and 4K Blu-ray. Um, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a suggestion, too, that um, Charlie Hunnam is just not a feature actor. He just isn't. 
I don't think he's I don't think he's got the persona or the gravitas or the appeal to be a feature movie actor. I have a bit of an issue with the with the, the more recent Guy Ritchie movies. Yeah. Um, Including the Sherlock Holmes stuff? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can't sell me a movie by saying Sherlock Holmes and you have to say it's a Guy Ritchie movie, mm. then there's something wrong there. Yeah. And uh, this Guy Ritchie-ness of making classic stories with this, with this directing technique that he uses just doesn't cut it for me because it takes away from the story. Well, he has, he has a very inflexible style. It's his style. It works for things like Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch. And, uh, Snatch. And Snatch was great. I and Rock it. and Roller. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And when he's doing his own material, but they keep wanting to kind of borrow him as a brand and pair him with other brands. His, it never works. His, I mean, for me, his style doesn't work in historical films. I, you, man for, I, it's just too too slick. Yeah. To, you take me out. I didn't feel I was in Excalibur days. No. I didn't feel I was in Sherlock Holmes days when no. I've seen Sherlock Holmes. It takes you completely out of the element. Yeah, it does. So, yeah, it does. Well, anyway, uh, you know, it's just, it doesn't... It's out on 8K? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was next year. A uh, bunch of extras in here. Jude Law is maybe the best thing about this, but even he just feels like like he's ten years too old for for what he's trying to do here. Um, I just it's just a it's a really lackluster King Arthur and not well told. I have a particular problem, by the way, with Guy Ritchie's Man from Uncle, which I just think is boring beyond belief. I, it's amazing to me how misbegotten that movie is. Did not and, see it. Oh, it's just so bad. Uh, and then the last two, real quickly. Uh, there's this book, Everything, Everything. They sent us the book. You ever heard of the book? No. There's the book. They sent us the book along with the Blu-ray. Now a major motion picture. Okay. Yeah, and, and I hadn't even heard of the movie. So this is clearly bonked. Uh, it comes to us from Warner Brothers. Uh, almost no extras here. Everything, Everything is a, uh, it's, it, it kind of, you know, it comes on the heels of a lot of these other movies now. We have a lot of interracial love stories. I think the Obama presidency and the biracial, having a biracial president, and then of course Tiger Woods, and a lot of other, you know, celebrities who come from mixed race backgrounds has sort of given the culture permission to consider these things in movies now. Uh, the Flash has a lot of, you know, Flash just sort of ignores race completely. So then we had things like Loving, and uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the one with David Oyelowo is the African prince. And, uh, you know, a lot of these... Uh, so this is, this is a thing now, apparently, that uh, everybody kind of feels they have a license to do. And that's what this is. This is a, uh, a mixed-race romance, a young romance thing. And uh, it, uh, it, it's okay. Um, I think it's uh, one of those young adult novels that probably has a higher following among people who are half my age. But um, the book has pictures from the movie. Yeah, that's a little cheesy. <laughs> and there are pictures of the two people. Yeah, I, in every show. It is. It's a, it's it's schmaltzy. Um, and then before we get into uh, some uh, classic movies or some porn films, we got both over here. We'll see how many we can we can get through. Um, I just want to say this is this is this is everything that's wrong with studios in a nutshell. Snatched everything. Snatched is an absolutely stillborn comedy with uh, Amy Schumer and Goldie Hawn as mother and daughter, and uh, it, it, this is basically somebody said, "Why don't we remake Ruthless People?" Uh, except we'll do it with Amy Schumer and Goldie Hawn. It's not funny. How do you put Amy Schumer and Goldie Hawn in a movie and it's not funny? How does that? Something's how does that, wrong. Something's so wrong. It's unbelievable. Uh, Jonathan Levine is the director. Did it, did it do well? No, it made no money. The thing crashed and burned right from the beginning. Yeah. Nobody went to see it. Hey, to the audience for once. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, by the way, this summer, what do you think? Of, what do you think of that statistic? This is the the uh, lowest grossing summer, the worst box office performing summer. I don't think lowest grossing, but fewest tickets sold, certainly, in 25 years. Really? Yeah. Yeah. This is, the, this is the one that Spielberg and Lucas warned about, where there were so many expensive tent poles that they, they just all pulled each other down like a, like a line of dominoes. Yeah, there are other, other, other factors, too. Netflix, uh, that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, for sure. You know, people would rather stay yeah. home. Yeah. Popcorn prices. Yeah, for sure. 
Uh, I just started watching Defenders. You seen the Defenders? No. Are you even following this? No. You, did you watch Daredevil? No. Did you watch Luke Cage? No. No. Did you watch Jessica Jones? Of course not. No. Well, yeah, you better not have watched it. But I swam with sharks. <laughs> played with. No, this is recent. <laughs> Last few years. No, the, the, the Defenders, this is, this is the, the TV version, Marvel's TV thing, like what they're doing in the movies. So they start off with two seasons of Daredevil, one season of Luke Cage, one season of Jessica Jones, one season of Iron Fist, and now they all come together to fight Sigourney Weaver. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. I worked in television, but... Uh, you don't never, watch any. I never really... Uh, I'm into serials. Yeah. I don't like to be told, come back next week if you want to know yeah. what happens. Yeah, it's it's addicting, unfortunately. Anyway, snatched. Ooh. Um, all right, uh, let's go into some uh, some classic movies here. Nadim, is there anything that, uh, that, that that jumps out at you that is highly recommended to people? Whale Rider. Yeah, right? I think that's a great movie. It is a great movie. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's a terrific movie. Whale Rider is out on a 15th anniversary Blu-ray edition. Uh, Nikki Caro's absolutely wonderful, wonderful movie is part of the Shout Select line. Uh, Shout's giving kind of the royal treatment to uh, quote-unquote select films. And uh, this is a New Zealand film, coming of age. This the, the, you know, the young actress in this thing is just absolutely tremendous. She won an Oscar, no? She was nominated. nominated. Keisha, Keisha Castle Hughes. Yeah, she was nominated. Yeah, she was nominated for an Oscar, and she's just absolutely wonderful. Terrific in this movie. I, you know, what, what's so interesting to me is the, um, the modern tribal dynamic. You know, I find Maori culture really, really interesting. Um, you've known some Maoris too, haven't you? Uh, have I what? You've known some Maoris. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, 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 I had a, I knew a Maori. It's wonderful with hummus. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew a Maori guy here for, uh, for a little while who was teaching a bunch of us how to play rugby. It was an awful lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure he schooled you. Oh yeah, no. It's, it, well, it's funny when you have when you have a bunch of when you have a bunch of unco fairly uncoordinated bunch of white guys who really badly want to learn rugby. The, the and you know and you have a Maori guy who very patiently is sort of dealing with all of you. What what becomes really clear is that these are guys who sit in cubicles and behind computers all week. And a Maori guy wants to teach you rugby. You feel like I am young and I am rough. And you start having these delusions of yourself, you know, entering a new phase of life. It's like a midlife crisis. You want to buy a motorcycle jacket and a, and a motorcycle. But, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I do love the Maori culture. There's so much that's so fascinating to me about it. And what I, what I love about this movie is the way that it, it sort of introduces you to the way that a lot of those traditions and customs have mutated in the modern age and how they don't fit so comfortably. Um, yes, but on the... By, on the, on the Flip side of the coin, it has more than other cultures like the Aborigines in Australia, which yeah. are completely. I mean, the Maoris are actually part of New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, the Aborigines, they they have a contract. I mean, yeah. they were they were dealt yeah. with a contract, and they're very much a part, including now the the flag of New Zealand is about to change. Oh, is it? Yeah, and they've. Uh, it seems the one that's most in the running is a black flag with a white, with a white fern, which is uh, similar to the to the design on the rugby players, all black, oh, all black. That's great. Um, but it, uh, it the flag is reverting to Maori yeah. symbols, which is very much part of New Zealand. Is it going to lose the Union Jack? Yes. So they're they're following what yes. Canada did back in whenever it was seventy yeah. something yeah. when when it went maple leaf. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. So and there's some been some funny designs. They had a yeah. competition and there are three. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty interesting. But I think that uh, a whale rider was uh, uh, way ahead of its time in uh, in making uh, bringing to light uh, girls and women. Yeah. In you know what Wonder Woman sure. is recently. Good this point. is a, this is a Wonder Woman of what is it 15 20 years ago when did yeah. it come out? Yeah. Um, no, but this, based this in in reality. 15th anniversary, 15 years. Yeah, yeah, there's there's I mean some spiritual aspect to the movie but um, um, I think it's great. Well, fantastic movie. We 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 both love it. Uh, based on a novel uh, by Witi Imaira Ihmaira Ihmaira 
I'm sorry to all of the all all of the Kiwi people who listen to this podcast for for not knowing how to pronounce that. Uh, Nikki Caro wrote and directed the film uh, beautifully, absolutely beautifully, and this is the first time it's ever been on Blu-ray from Shot Select. We absolutely love it. Um, Shakes the Clown is also out. Does that warrant any discussion? I, I don't know it. <laughs> Shakes the Clown. You never saw Shakes the Clown? No. It's the uh, what's the what's the great quote? I wonder if they even have it here. Yeah, there it is. Betsy Sherman. This is the only decent pull quote this movie has ever had. They've lived off of it for. You know, 20 years or whatever. Uh, <laughs> seriously, 1991 is 26 years. Uh, the Citizen Kane of alcoholic clown movies. <laughs> it's one of the best pull quotes I've ever seen. The Citizen Kane of alcoholic clown movies. Um, but you know what? Bobcat Goldthwaite has gone on to be quite the the uh, acidic auteur. He's he's uh, he's gone on to make some really twisted movies uh, in a very that all have something to say, and I don't think anybody really expected that. He wrote and directed this, and a lot of people have uh, kind of had to revisit it and see, give him some more credit for what he was doing here. Uh, Shakes the Clown is is not a particularly good movie. He's trying to work something out, but uh, it has some stuff in it. You know, to take Florence Henderson for example, Flor uh, one of the first things in the movie, one of the first bits is that he's. It takes place in a world where every every guy's a clown. Okay. And one of the first bits in the movie is he has just had a wild night with Florence Henderson, who looks like somebody just went over her with, you know, a bulldozer. And he wakes up with, I'm sorry to be so gross, but it's in the movie. He wakes up with his head next to a toilet as her son is urinating on the toilet and isn't quite as accurate as you might expect. This is one of the first bits in the movie. Now, if you if you manage to get through that without walking out, you are then treated to gang fights with mimes and all kinds of other <laughs> stuff that's just very bizarre. But uh, you know what? It I think revisiting it, people will discover that there's there's a lot more going on. So that's on Blu-ray now. Uh, let me uh, hit a couple of these things. Punchline with Sally Field and Tom Hanks. Also out on Blu-ray from uh, Mill Creek. Uh, I think this is a better film than people gave it credit for at the time. David Seltzer wrote and directed this. It is, um, it, a lot of people kind of thought, you know, this was Tom Hanks, you know, throwing a bone to, to Sally Field and Sally Field trying to do something that she shouldn't have done as a woman trying to learn, you know, the ropes of stand-up comedy. But it actually uh, has more to say about stand-up comedy than uh, I think a lot of people gave it credit for. John Wayne, uh, double feature. This is uh, from Paramount and CBS. This is Rio Lobo and Big Jake. Uh, I don't think either one is a particularly great film, but they're both kind of classic uh, John Wayne movies. Fans are particularly fond of both of them, even if critics aren't. Uh, and, you know, it's, I mean, it's, uh, you know, what do you want? Bit Real Lobo and Big Jake on Blu-ray. Um, Blackbeard, who's been in the movies quite a bit uh, of late, including the uh, one of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Uh, you know, a legendary figure, never been done quite right. This film doesn't quite do it either. This is from 2005, directed by Kevin Connor, uh, starring Angus McFadden, who was a bigger deal 15, 20 years ago than he is now. Uh, Richard Chamberlain, Stacey Keach, uh, a lot of people show up in this, Jessica Chastain. Not, it's, it's okay. It's, it's adequate if you're, you're into pirates and you like watch, watch black sails or whatever. We need Guy Ritchie to do black people. Oh, no. Please, no. <laughs> Seriously, no. Uh, John Travolta and Scarlett Johansson in A Love Song for Bobby Long. Uh, which is also out now from Mill Creek. Uh, this is only on DVD, not on Blu-ray. A little bit, a uh, little bit saccharine. But it, if you like the two stars, it'll, it's uh, it's uh, it's a film worth rediscovering. Uh, let's talk uh, for a second here. We've got some uh, criterions before I, I launch us into the uh, interview with uh, with Terry. Um, Sid and Nancy, mm. Criterion Blu-ray. Wow. Does it hold up? Does it? Does it? I don't know. I think it does. I think it does. I think it holds up really well. I, we, Mark and I have been talking of late about... Uh, you've seen the the, uh, the, uh, the Churchill uh, trailer, Gary Oldman as Churchill. Have you seen that yet? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's amazing, right? Uh, what is the the, uh, the finest hour? Uh, right, dark, right, right, Darkest right. hour. Darkest hour. Um, it's kind of amazing, right? The makeup? Absolutely. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't look like Gary Oldman at all. Phenomenal. Good thing um, it looks like Churchill. Yeah, well, he looks like Sid. I mean, seriously, yeah. who would ever have thought? Now, imagine at the time of Sid and Nancy when he's disappearing into Sid Vicious. <laughs> if somebody had said to you, that guy that's playing Sid Vicious, 
One day he'll a couple play of decades, Churchill. he's going to be playing Churchill. <laughs> Whoever would have believed that? <laughs> yeah. Right? It's amazing. Uh, yeah, Sid and Nancy out in its, uh, its Criterion Edition uh, Blu-ray. Bunch of extras, as you would expect. Two audio commentaries, including the original 1994 commentary with uh, Abby Wool and Gary Oldman and Chloe Webb. Uh, Grill Marcus, uh, the, the cultural historian, uh, Julian Temple, and it, I mean, everybody shows up here. There's tons and tons of stuff here. Everything you ever needed to know about the Sex Pistols and Sid Vicious, and uh, it, it's, it's loaded up. You will learn more about punk just from the extras here. It's phenomenal. Um, also, this is a 4K digital transfer restoration, which, which leads me to believe that it's probably not going to be too long before we see Criterion releasing 4K Blu-rays. I oh, think that's in the office. They haven't, they haven't uh, yet. Not yet. Criterion has not. Mm -mm. So far, it's Fox and Universal. Disney hasn't even. Uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy is their first. That's hmm. their first 4K. So uh, even Disney has not fully. They're just on, just barely embracing 4K now. Uh, Warner Brothers has. So I mean, you know, the major studios have. Lionsgate obviously has. But uh, by and large, 4K is not mainstreamed yet. So I think it's are, interesting. Are the clientele there for 4K? That's a good question. I have to look at the uh, at the sales figures for uh, 4K players and TVs, see what kind of installed base. They're trying, mm -hmm. because part of the idea of discontinuing 3D televisions was to push for 4K televisions, to get people to now adopt 4K as their standard, because 3D clearly wasn't doing it. And uh, anyway, Sid and Nancy, absolutely terrific. Alex Cox approved edition. And uh, then, did, when you were chasing wildebeest, did you ever watch Sasha Guitry movies? I'm going to guess no. no. No, okay. No. Uh, <laughs> I used to end up at the drive-in watching uh, Gone with the Wind, and mainly martial arts movies. Okay. You know, yeah. where the cheap seats at the front of the theater were foldable seats, and right, right after the uh, movie, everybody thought they could do all the moves and would smash chairs. And <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. I'm I'm jealous now because I was watching and laughter at was, uh, at uh, at um, at uh, horror movies. Yeah, I was probably watching. Not believe I was watching Gilligan's Island. Yeah, yeah. I did watch Gilligan's Island. It, it did actually that came on too on television. See? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? What? Gilligan's Island made it to Africa. You had yeah. one channel and black and white. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. First season of Gilligan's Island was black and white. Uh, well, Sasha Guitry, who's one of my favorite uh, French auteurs of the, uh, he kind of, I mean, he directed for a long time, but of the pre-New Wave period in particular, Sasha Guitry's movies are just light and frolicky and frothy and, and just jovial and absolutely wonderful. He's kind of like Vincent Minnelli in a lot of ways. He has a similar sense of life. Uh, from 1951, which is somewhat late-ish in, uh, in the Sasha Guitry canon of films that are, that are really relevant, uh, is La Poison or La Poison, if you want to pronounce it the way that Mark would. And... Um, uh, I mean, L.A. Poison. Yeah, exactly. L.A. Poison, there you go. Uh, this, was, this, is, uh, this is one where he, uh, he, he worked with, uh, direct, uh, with actor Michel Simon, who was really a tremendous figure at the time. And uh, it's just a really fascinating, dark comedy um, about a, a, a completely dysfunctional marriage. And it, it kind of does, we talked earlier about uh, uh, Ruthless People. It has kind of a Ruthless People vibe, but with Sasha Guitry's sweetness. So it's dark but sweet. It's really a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm shocked that uh, this would wind up, I guess I shouldn't be, that, you know, Criterion always surprises me with something every once in a while, but I, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, a bunch of kinos this week, too. I uh, was going to try and start the show with the good, the bad, and the ugly theme, and I, 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 for some reason I don't have it. There you go. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> That's really good. You should have told me. I would have started I, the show go. for you. I had no idea you could do that. <laughs> is that a, is, well, that's great. Uh, yeah, Kino has... Uh, we've got a DVD from Kino. They went and mined us out of uh, the 20th and MGM library, and uh, there are three commentaries on here, and they're all tremendous, including one of them with my late colleague Richard Schickel. Um, who I listen to this and I really, really miss him. He's just such a crusty curmudgeon. Um, you know, Mar Mar Mark and I, <laughs> I don't know if we told you this, when Richard Schickel died, uh, Mark went and dug up a, an old, uh, some old emails of his from, from Richard Schickel when we were having Lafka emails going around and uh, 
how just curmudgeonly and insulting he could be, <laughs> and I don't have time for this, and you know. Uh, Mark sent an email out for uh, soliciting s advice or something for the website, and Schickle was like, "Yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I don't have time." Such a such a funny man, and not intentionally so. But his commentary here is great. He had such a such a great mind for the movies. Um, it's just it's just wonderful, and the transfer is really good. I think they could probably still do better, uh, but you know, all things considered, this is probably as good as this movie is going to look. And uh, you know, there's all stuff kinds of stuff here on the reconstruction of it, and some great uh, featurettes, one of them on Ennio Morricone. Uh, it's just, it's fantastic. So, um, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, Sergio Leone. It's, uh, of, of the three films, is this the best one, I think? Fistful I think of so. A few dollars more, yeah. Fistful, yeah. They're all good, they all have their, you know, um, they all have their, their high points, but I like this the best. Yeah, yeah. I do too, I do too. And then the, uh, the rest of the kinos include, real quickly, uh, Little Nikita, not a great movie, Sidney Poitier and River Phoenix. Uh, this, is a, this is kind of a lackluster spy film directed by Richard Benjamin from kind of the tail end of his significant part of his career. Uh, you know, this kind of should have been better, but it's more of a star vehicle just to pair those two together. Uh, kind of a Cold War uh, dud. Uh, Barton Fink, uh, legendary, mm -hmm. goes without saying, won the Palme d'Or for the, uh, the Coen brothers, the first film, and likely the only film, I don't know if you know this, this is the only film that will ever go down as the one that won both director and picture and screenplay at, the, uh, at Cannes. Really? They changed the rules. Now those three awards need to go to three different films. Huh. It kind of ruined the whole share the wealth custom at Cannes that they gave screenplay director and picture to this. And, and it, they should have known because Roman Polanski was head of the jury that year. Now, of all the films that were in the competition that year, which one screamed Polanski? Yeah. I mean, sure, there's a jury of other people, but he, <laughs> there was, that was no question. And uh, then the, uh, the last two here uh, from Kino, one is uh, Emil Jannings, the, uh, the great German actor great German silent actor in uh, Varieté. This is from the F.W. Murnau collection of films. They're not all Murnau films, I should point out. Uh, they're just from the Murnau collection. This is directed by E.A. DuPont. Cinematographer was Carl Freund. You know about Carl Freund? No. Legendary German cinematographer. Was, he shot some of the most haunting movies of the German silent period. Went on to do his best work on television on I Love Lucy. Wow. Huh? Very interesting. Yeah. And by the way, that's not a joke. I Love Lucy was an incredibly difficult show to shoot because unlike three camera shows of today, it was shot on film and those cameras had fixed lenses. So anytime you see a close up, that means that somebody had to truck in like a mother to get in and to get in close. And if you see some of the actual iso footage from those cameras where there's the focus pulling going all over the place and the cameras piling over cables, it's, it's kind of fascinating what, they, what, get, what got cut out. So Carl Freund was a revolutionary cinematographer in television too. Were the cameras on pedestals with I Love Lucy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were big wheels and mm -hmm. the whole thing is fascinating. Anyway, uh, Varieté, really, really interesting uh, silent film. Emil Jannings uh, is, a, is, a, is a carnival guy. Uh, it's kind of like a little bit like Sunrise by the, in, in some respects. Uh, it's, he's a carnival worker who you know, ha has this sexual obsession with uh, another uh, worker at the carnival. And it's really, really, it's really kind of dark and disturbing and yet uh, at the same time uh, very, very aesthetically satisfying and pleasing. English and, subtitle? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, and then uh, Beggars of Life uh, a, is the other one, which is uh, also a wonderful, wonderful movie from 1928. Uh, the, right in the, the like the very, very early sound end of uh, end of the um, uh, end of the silent era. Uh, this one is still silent, but you can you can tell just stylistically that it's moving toward the sound era. It's really interesting. Um, and now we're going to move into my interview with Terry Sanders, my very first film school instructor from many years ago, who has a new film out called Liza, Liza, Skies Are Gray, a, um, a really, really interesting movie uh, that is, it's a road trip set in the 1960s, and uh, it's got a lot of interesting things to say about today and a lot of interesting, interesting things to say about then. 
and I do recommend it. So here, without further ado, is my interview with my old teacher and Oscar-winning filmmaker, Terry Sanders. It is my tremendous privilege to be speaking with uh, my very first film school instructor, who is also an Academy Award-winning filmmaker himself, Terry Sanders. Terry, uh, thank you for, for uh, taking time out. It's, it's always great to talk to you again. And congratulations on your new film, uh, which is a narrative film, Liza, Liza, Skies Are Gray. Um, and you're, you're, what you've mainly done for most of your career are documentaries, and this is a narrative film uh, that uh, that harkens back to a lot of stuff in the 60s that I think is is really quite pertinent now, a real kind of uh, fascinating coming-of-age road trip that uh, that has a lot of really powerful uh, undertones to it. Talk about what what led this to this turn from documentaries to this particular narrative project. I will. I have to say that I began the first 10 years of my filmmaking career uh, was in narrative film starting with uh, the short story film uh, A Time Out of War that I did with my brother Dennis that was the first student film to win a real Oscar. That was narrative. Then we did two uh, uh, narrative films, the adaptation of Crime and Punishment that introduced George Hamilton, and then we did a Korean war story called War Hunt, which introduced Robert Redford. <clears throat> so um, on those... Uh, Really, at that time, uh, I'll just briefly say that the Directors Guild didn't allow uh, two directors' credits. So, being the younger brother, I would take the producer's credit, and then Dennis took the director. Anyway, so, but after 10 years, uh, our partnership sort of split up, and I got into documentaries with David Walper and did uh, many, many uh, documentaries. And, uh, but during that period, the, the Liza Liza, the background of that is that uh, in the 60s, I actually uh, read a colleague's uh, coming of age story about the first love and I just, the thought struck me, hey, I can do better than that. So I, so I wrote uh, a script, basically I wrote it in the 60s and it was going to be made as uh, the first film under the um, um, American Film Institute, which had been newly formed. They were going to do one film a year under their banner this was going to be it. And then the funding fell through. So the script sat on the shelf for, uh, for 45 years. Wow. Uh, while I was doing documentaries and, and then my filmmaking daughter, Jessica Sanders happened to read it and she said, Hey, you should make this. And so, uh, you know, I, I reread it. You know, I like, certainly like the script, but in the meantime, it had been written in the sixties, a contemporary drama love story. And um, by uh, 2014, it was now a uh, period piece, which made uh, it more complicated to produce with vintage vehicles and vintage uh, costumes and wardrobe and props and everything. But uh, I figured out a way of doing it uh, for uh, as within, with a few investor friends that I had that put a little money into it. And uh, I made it as a definitely, uh, you know, a passion project kind of film. And I have to say that I grew up, uh, my mother and father were both artists. My father was an architect designer, but also an artist. My mother was a sculptor and painter. And uh, I was always surrounded by painters. And, you know, when a painter wants to they can do a painting, they don't go out and say, maybe I can raise some money so I can do a painting. They just do it. Right, and uh, that was my attitude with this was, uh, you know, on the on the way over one side is is studios and high budget independence, and way over on the other side is uh, art films and uh, experimental films, and this falls into that category. You, you know, I, I think it's so fascinating that this is a script that was written in the era that it that it depicts and as you said it's it's now become a period piece which i think speaks to the authenticity of it because it doesn't very often we will see films and i, I won't name any but they they're never quite able to capture their their era because they're looking backward at it they're looking through a, a veneer of, of of history and and perspective and you kind of you you don't really feel as though they they understand the period and this one I, it, it never feels anything less than absolutely authentic. It feels as though you really are in the moment, and that's obviously why. 
Um, did that change how you directed the actors? Was there, or or was it was everything just very matter of fact, and we treat the material as the material, or was there any sort of discussion of that dichotomy when when you were making it? Well, the actors, of course, being born like you know this this century. Yeah, much. they were both. One was fifteen years old, Mikey Madison, and. Um, uh, she's Sean wonderful. And she's wonderful, by the way. She really is. Yeah, she's now in a series called Better Things, which is on FX, which is in its, starting its second season. She's great in it. But uh, part of the authenticity is that uh, the story had to be about very young people, 15 and 16. And so I, I was determined not to cast, uh, you know, 20 year olds as teenagers or something the way I often see in, in coming of age films. So uh, Mikey was just uh, getting interested in acting. Actually, this was her very first film, and she was a natural. I mean, she just, anything that came out of her mouth, I believed. But as far as uh, the film itself, yeah, it was written in the era that it was, it was about. And it's basically made up of fragments of my life. You know, it's not autobiographical in a real pure sense, but in the another sense everything in it is something i either lived through or saw or whatever and uh part of the uh attitude in making the film is a lot of films try to explain everything you know and and some people are, are i think maybe put off a little by the film that doesn't you know explain everything leaves things to the imagination but i i sort of that was purposeful because in growing up i no one ever explains things to uh kids you know why people get divorced or why this happens or that happens i mean just sort of live through it and, and including uh you know wars and everything else you, a lot of it flies over your head i mean you're living it but you're not you don't understand it and and that's part of life we don't really understand things that happen you know yeah give it look look at the political situation right now yeah Wow. Well, I, I, what um, what was what were the logistics like for putting this together? I mean, uh, you know, you're you're making an independent period film. Um, obviously, being in Southern California helps, and a lot of Southern California hasn't really changed since the 1960s. Um, uh, and I think you used the locations and the environs very, very well. But otherwise, what were some of the logistic challenges? Well. Um the, the name of the game, of course, is finding locations that you didn't have to spend money to yeah. or much money to change. And um, there, if you're if you're diligent in, in your location scouting, you can find wonderful little pockets of, of uh, <laughs> time warps, you know. And of course, the, the the coast and the beach doesn't. I mean, the sky and the sea remains the same. But uh, I was actually made this film as an ultra low budget film under the uh, Screen Actors Guild ultra low budget agreement which enabled me it's a great agreement for uh, if, you, if you make a theatrical film I mean, we're not talking about TV or something if you make a theatrical film and don't spend over two hundred thousand dollars you're allowed to pay actors a hundred dollars a day and only for the days that they work right so the kind of the approach that was was, hey, we're making an art film, and every, anyone who wants to join, great. We all we, we'll all get a hundred dollars a day, and if we don't want to do it, fine, don't do it. But uh, I, I found like <clears throat> wonderful people came out of the uh, atmosphere to join in making the film. And uh, the other thing about locations today, as opposed to in the '60s. Sure, there were buildings that uh, weren't there in the in the 60s, and uh, one great example is all the lines in the highways because it's a motorcycle road trip up the Pacific Coast Highway. In the 60s, all the center lines were uh, white, and but starting in the 70s, uh, they all were painted yellow. So, with the the digital uh, cinematography and digital editing came to the rescue. Rather simply, you can change digitally uh, all those lines from uh, from yellow to white, and you could also make buildings disappear that weren't there, yeah. and also like modern light switches on walls, you could just erase. <clears throat> so that was a great help. 
that's terrific. I didn't I didn't even realize that you did that. That's great. Yeah, but and then but uh, you know the motorcycle. I just had uh, it was sort of a miracle that this film got made. Like the motorcycle itself, a '65 Triumph. Um, a fellow named Justin Cal, who has Glory Motors in Glendale, and he's a surfer, but he supplies uh, motorcycles and expertise to hundred million dollar Hollywood movies like Captain America. He read the script, loved it, and he donated uh, for the use of the for the picture. Uh, 65 Triumph, and he became second unit director and stunt coordinator. And things happened like that. I had a uh, wonderful line producer who was just fantastic, who was able to uh, just find things and put things together. Um, and uh, it was amazing how the crew just uh, formed itself. That's great. How long did you shoot for? We were able to shoot for uh, about 25 days on 30 locations up and down the coast from Pacific Palisades up to Big Sur. That's great. And they were not long days. They were not long days. So one of the things I wanted to do a civilized, uh, like European, as I've heard, European style, where you, you don't work over 10 hours a day and you have a nice lunch in there somewhere. Um and uh, also, sometimes we work four-day weeks because uh, partly having not a lot of money to uh, have all kinds of extra crew, I needed uh, an extra day to uh, get organized for the uh, for the shooting. So some some of the weeks were four-day weeks. Nothing was over uh, five-day week. Well, that's great. Well, Terry, that I, I, that I brings us right about to the end of our of our uh, uh, moment here. But I uh, and I would encourage people to go and see it. Lies are lies, the skies are gray. Um, the, I, to my knowledge, I can't think of any other films that were written in in one decade and then filmed uh, this long after the fact. I'm sure there may be a couple, but uh, you're certainly in a rare class with this one. And I congratulate you again. For, for making it and uh, for pulling off what I think is, is really uh, an incredibly touching and meaningful film and which kind of in many ways I think is a great allegory for a lot of, uh, a lot of the disenfranchisement young people feel today as well. So thank you for your movie. Thank you for speaking with us and uh, best of luck with it. And can I just give one shout out to Eric Darstead, the cinematographer who I've worked with for uh, many, many decades. Absolutely. And did fa- fabulous job we we shot primarily also in available light which uh which was important to the film but thanks a lot Wade. thank you terry we'll speak soon okay okay, okay. Bye-bye. take care bye-bye and there it is so i uh, i urge people to go out and see that wherever you can find it it's gonna be making its way around the country it's starting here in la nadim thank you for being with us and and there it is <laughs> all right thank you and Nadine will be back with us next week. And uh, everybody, have a great week as well.